Welcome to Jesus Wars, uh, a quest for the historical Jesus. Um, in today's show, we have uh, a new guest who's going to be sharing his thoughts. Uh, we met at a Facebook group called uh, Historical Jesus, Higher Criticism, and Second Temple Judaism. So, Mr. Uh, Gaio, would you like to tell us about your interest in Jewish studies, uh, historical Jesus, and uh, these topics, and why is it relevant to discuss them as Jews? Okay. All right. Um, a lot there to unpack. Okay. So, um, my interest in it comes like I... I have nominal Jewish ancestry, so, you know, there's, I wasn't raised Jewish, but I have Jewish ancestry. Um, my mother converted to Christianity when I was very young, and so I was raised in a home where, like, Christianity was partially, like, my one of my parents was involved with it. Um, so I grew up around, you know, I guess the teachings of Christianity and stuff. By the time that I was eight i was beginning to ask questions by the time i was 12 i'd read the their bible cover to cover twice well i take that back i read the torah the tanakh twice in the new testament once i had a lot of problems with the new testament that um didn't agree with the torah and i would ask questions of the leaders and you know it in the end, they would usually tell me things like you just have to have faith uh, and just kind of believe in it. Um, when I got old enough, though, I decided to kind of study things for myself, started going to libraries and whatnot. Uh, eventually ended up going to Bible college. Um, uh, it was Christian Bible college at the time. I was studying um, theology, church history, the Gospels, uh, evangelism, stuff like that. And then, um, again, I would always bump heads with the professors because I would point out the inaccuracies, the differences between the, you know, what they called the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, it started to get to a point where a lot of the conversations were going, well, you probably should go in your own direction because I wasn't towing the, the de denominational party line and whatnot. Um, and I guess as time grew, I became more and more interested in like what having some Jewish ancestry meant, what it meant to me. And for me, the the Torah has always been part of my life. It's always spoke to me. Um, I can't say the same uh, about the New Testament. So uh, I ended up deciding to go through a process of conversion. Um, you know, there's some steps along the way. But um, in the process, you know, I did do a lot of studying and research into um, you know, read it, learning how to read Greek and, and read some of the text in Greek to see what they actually say for myself. You know, as I was going through conversion, I was learning more and more Hebrew. Um, between all the courses that I took in Bible college and then when I was, took some courses in yeshiva and, and uh, you know, Kalel and stuff like that, um, I was doing a lot of studies into Second Temple Judaism uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, parting of the ways between Christianity and Judaism. And through my research, I felt like I started to find a kernel of truth there that it's maybe not, there is a consensus of scholars that kind of believe this way, but there's not necessarily a major consensus. Um, you know, through my research, I came to the conclusion that all of the followers of Jesus, including Jesus himself, were Jewish and remain so. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to talk about today is how there is actual document evidence that um, the early community of Jesus, um, namely James and Peter, saw themselves within the traditional rabbinic structure. They, they make statements uh, referring to uh, the initiation according to Moses. Um, uh, the great assembly, things that we know refer to the great assembly that started in Babylonian captivity. And really it was the foundation of the, uh, uh, the Pharisee, the Pharisaic movement, like the rabbinic movement kind of came out of that, the, the idea of rabbis and synagogues and stuff like that. Um, 
but so yeah, my my interest in that has grown over time. Uh, you know, studying you know the the formations of what eventually became you know rabbinic Judaism and what became Christianity and like the parting of ways and stuff like that. So that that's how I could best summarize kind of my entrance into this, my my interest in this, and then for me. And this has always been the case, and this is always this is what kind of made me take a change in my journey, is I always held to the facts and the evidence, and I, I always like disregarded people's opinion about things. So when you see a piece of evidence, you take that and you should evaluate what you believe on that instead of trying to make that evidence conform to what you believe, which I think is what a lot of people do. And they talk about the difference between uh, you know, exegesis and eisegesis, searching for confirmation bias or trying to figure out like the historical kernel of truth. Um, so, I mean, for a while there, I had an extensive library of books on the historical Jesus, Second Temple Judaism, and just like a myriad of things. Um, and then, so that's kind of my story now. The second part, I believe you asked how that relates to Jews. And um, I don't know, my opinion about that is is maybe a little different. Um, the, you know, the, the forums that I've been engaging with, like the one we met on, was more a dialogue with people in a journey of exploring what it means to leave Christianity and find truth that is different than what they're used to. So I wouldn't say my idea was like Jews need to have a view about Jesus, but as Christianity is one of the world's largest religions and it comes out of Christianity, it's helpful to understand it. And, you know, I think um, Amy Jill Levine makes a good idea of, you know, in her book, The Mis Misunderstood Jew, um, that having an interfaith dialogue and understanding each other is beneficial. Um, Having a right understanding of the historical Jesus can give Jews the ability to answer people who want to make theological claims and try to advocate for adherence to Christianity over Judaism. So in, in short, I think that would be my answer. Well, what I appreciate about you is that you were uh, educating the members of our group and there's always people with crazy theories and there's always people who want to, you know, destroy one argument or the other. But you were uh, very intellectually honest, showing how there are a few Jewish scholars who have, you know, as, as neutral or as positive view of Jesus as possible based on, on the historical evidence yeah. ver versus this other group that I'm part of where all they want to do is destroy Christianity and it's it's silly it's almost like um people that are fighting over football or uh politics or something like that where they demonize the other side and they don't even they're not even willing to hear out what people are saying and you mentioned that there are people who are pursuing truth and now they they're struggling with theological issues with christianity but is there a possibility to look at both judaism and christianity from an objective way in from a truth perspective in the sense of like can we put both to the test and see where we end up at versus or are we coming up with a with an answer like judaism is true and if jesus doesn't comply to what traditional judaism is then he's out or the other way around christianity is already true and if judaism doesn't speak uh in in high regard of jesus then it's worthless um how do you you stay balanced and are able to uh, stay the course? Because the, I think that a lot of people don't even want to engage in these type of conversations because they become so hateful. Yeah. Um, well, a good sense of your own uh, emotional intelligence and not engaging in toxic communication online, but that, that's kind of difficult. Um, a lot of people engage in, you know, classic, you know, uh, when an argument fails, they go to ad hominem attacks. They start, you know, name calling, tearing you down, accusing you of things. For me, I'm just going to stick to the facts and 
always have an honest assessment of things, even in the own, my own failures and my own argument. Um, there was somebody I was engaging with on a similar forum and um, they were talking about textual criticism of the new Testament and the historical Jesus. And then he starts going, well, Abraham and Moses weren't necessarily biblical figures. So, you know, I, and I educated him that my view of the Torah is pretty much similar. I look at the do document hypothesis that, you know, the four sources or five sources um, that went into a, the creation of the text. Um, I mean, I take the same view of textual criticism and historical scholarship for the Tanakh, the Torah, and for the New Testament. Um, there is a uniqueness between the two texts, um, which is different. There are scribal errors in both uh, translations, but they found more consistency in the transmission of the Torah. Um, and the difference is, is in the New Testament. And if we get into some of the, the you know, uh, topics we kind of talked about going over today, we'll, we'll get into the, there's there's a unique difference with the New Testament where there's not just scribal errors, but there's intentional errors to add um, pericopes or stories in the New Testament that aren't in the earliest manuscripts and sometimes find themselves at different places in the later Greek manuscripts. Um, so there was an intentional active effort to add theological claims to bolster, you know, their beliefs that is unique between the, you know, the, the scribal transmission of the two communities. But as far as between Jewish and Christian, I mean, I, I personally have a different view of things. Um, and I don't necessarily, my view is that there is one God but no religion has all the truth. And that, you know, within the, um, the Kabbalistic traditions within Judaism, the, the Klippot, uh, you know, the, the, the Hus covers the, let's just say Elohim, the, the divine light that's in all beings that are, you can find scattered throughout creation. And there's Hus that cover it. So like people's beliefs and, and, uh, religious views, they might have some elements of truth. There's elements of Christianity that takes from the Torah and Judaism that has changed the Western world for the better. Um, now it's it's the it's the the Torah that they have taken and repurposed, uh, added on additional things, but I believe it's the elements of Torah that has changed, you know, Western Europe and influenced, you know, a lot of the Western world. Um, some people say Judeo-Christian. I prefer like Judeo-Western values when we're talking about it. But um, there's been good that comes out of Christianity. Um, and there are good people in Christianity. So, you know, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, just because there may be intentional efforts to you know, change the text to say what they wanted to say doesn't mean there aren't good people who are going down this path. So I don't think you should ever demonize people, especially good people who their intentions are good, not not to harm anyone. Um, and I think the rabbis of the, you know, that that period of parting of the ways where the rabbis started to grapple with and they started to talk about the idea of what's become known as the Noahide tradition or the Ger Toshav or Ger Sadiq. The Gentiles don't necessarily, you know, the, if they follow the seven commands, you know, of the Noahide covenant, they have a place in the world to come. And they don't have to convert to Judaism. I think that was a way that the rabbis were starting to deal with this burgeoning movement that they were parting ways with, but still giving them kind of grace to be like, do their own thing. Um so I, you know, I, I don't think it's beneficial for either community to say their way is right or wrong. Personally, for me, what makes sense is Judaism, and I can make a clear case as to why that makes sense for me. But um, I don't think demonizing somebody who believes different than you is beneficial. So 
Are you familiar with the term uh, Bashar or Basharim? Um, it's been a while. You'd have to refer ref, refresh my memory on that one. So, you know, um, one way of interpreting the Bible that a lot of sectarian groups would do is that they would create their own interpretations. They were applied to their leaders and their circumstances. So uh, the idea that, that the Jewish Christians or the early followers of Jesus were uh, distorting uh, Jewish texts to, to tell their story is something that, that gets thrown around a lot. But if you look at the Yachat, the, the Dead Sea Scroll community, and even the rabbis in the Talmud, they interpret things and they apply things in a way that benefits their, their agenda. And, and everybody does it to to greater or smaller extent but uh, I guess you could say that the the Jewish followers of Jesus did it to the extreme where every single passage pointed to Jesus and there are very strange um, applications of, of prophetic passages that, uh, that that would be the first place where anti-missionaries would try to you know debunk uh, their claims but if you look at what other people were doing, um, you know, it's like they they were the the Yachad was calling the the Sadducees. Um they they had issue with the Sadducees because of the way they were treating the temple, and then they had issues with the Perushim, with the Pharisees uh as well. And then um and then in later rabbinic interpretation, you see that too, where they'll take a small passage and they'll make it into a huge mountain and and try to apply it or like almost like 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 force it into the text um do you think that that's something that, that we should consider um it, and also uh i don't know if you are familiar with the the book called the uh, the jewish annotated new testament um yeah. there they say that a lot of the passages that i have problems with in the book of hebrews and things like that they have um the interpretation it's it's almost like um like um, a version that is only used by certain groups. So, you know, there's issues with Septuagint, the way that it was uh, translated and almost like interpreted. And then there's also uh, the Aramaic version of that. So either whoever wrote that book was only grabbing stuff that would help their case, or that was the tradition that they were familiar with. So they applied it in support of their cause. So um, is it really... Do you see ever in the Jewish community where they 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 try to make such a strong case that their imp interpretation is so correct and every other interpretation is wrong when they when we we that study this stuff critically we know that everybody was um, reinterpreting and reapplying and re uh, you know creating their their story based on what they thought was right for them at that time versus you know throwing everybody out who they don't agree with and saying, well, their interpretation is heretical, but ours is right when we know that everybody was doing that at the same time. Um, you know, minor, minor and macro level, you know, on a, on a uh, micro and macro level. So on the small level, because at some point, the things that Christians misunderstood about the Greek Septuagint and their misunderstandings about those texts and the influence of Roman culture, the writings of Paul, it became something completely than, different than Jewish tradition. So it was no longer within the Jewish dialogue. Um, are there inter-Jewish arguments between the different communities, um, you know, of the first century you know, the, the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the Zealots, the Zakari, all the ones, you know, there was, of course, there was differences and different application. Um, however, when you're talking about prophetic prophecies, one, you know, the, every text has a culture and a tradition that it's written in. Who was it written to? Who it was written? Who was it written by? And sometimes, and the reason, like the sages say, you know, to translate is to lie. There are sayings that make sense in the original language, but when you translate it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, 
for example, uh, you know, and this is just um, I'm watching the M NPR um, broadcast and it's talking about immigrant stories about people coming over from um, Mexico into the U.S. And the Comic-Con Museum here in San Diego uh, has fi featured a Latin American uh, comic artist. And there's a lot of the stuff is written for a Spanish audience and a lot of the idioms and the jokes make sense in Spanish, but it's translated in English. And then those jokes that made sense in Spanish don't make sense in English. So when the language of the Torah was originally Hebrew, and then you have it translated into Greek for uh, the, the Septuagint, and then you remove that, from the period of time that happens and over time the hellenization hellenization of the jews um you know by the time we get to the second and third century where christianity is heavily influenced by the roman culture linguistics ideas the entire new testament for a majority of what we base our text in is from greek and a lot of the idioms and stuff that you find in there are influenced by the Greek, the well, the Roman culture, but it's written in Greek. Um, and so there is a loss of translation between the original and what we have. For the New Testament, what we have are copies of copies. And the earliest intact New Testament we have is from the, the Codex Sinaiticus, which is from, like, they date it to uh, 325 to 380, somewhere in that period. Um, after the Nicene Council, around the Nicene Council. Uh, we don't have an intact, you know, New Testament uh, before that. That's 300 years after, you know, Jesus passed. And if Jesus spoke in Aramaic and he went to synagogues, he would have read the, the scriptures in Hebrew. Um, and then we're having a text that's 300 years later in Greek. There's a loss of translation between the origin and whatever has been received or given to the early, um, the Catholic Church in the in the third and fourth century. Have you looked into the idioms used in the in the New Testament? Because there's a document written by uh, Dr. Ron Mo Mosley, which uh, he shows that if you do a a comparison of, of the amount of idioms uh with in the greek that they're all uh you know semitic in nature so even though it's a greek text the like you said the phrases that jesus uses are usually misunderstood because in the hebrew and the greek there's like um sometimes it rhymes or it has like a colloquial aspect to it so it could be that we're reading it with with a greek uh perspective just because not only is it greek but it has been interpreted by greco-roman thinking for hundreds of years but if we go back and we look at it in the in the greek in the hebrew or in the aramaic it's more um you know semitic and more uh in line with hillel and shammai and other uh proto rabbis of that time is that your perspective when when you um were sharing Gisa Bermesh, um, Amy G. Levine, uh, and other Jewish uh, scholars who have looked into the the Jewish aspect of, of Jesus, uh, do you feel that they have kind of re, um, reclaimed him as a, as a first century Jew who actually was within the, the context of that culture and even the, the things he said make more sense within uh, that uh almost like worldview and and frame of mind um well i think we'd have to establish a couple things um one who the historical jesus is through textual criticism what text is authentic um because if you're just taking the new testament as a whole um i mean the scholarship consensus is that the new testament is not historically accurate um and does not uh, accurately depict what uh, Jesus would have taught. Um, there are, but that's when you take it as a whole. Um, you know, really to get to that point, to answer that question, I think, you know, a few things need to be established first. Um, you know, uh, Geza Vermes says the historical Jesus is a much more elusive figure than the Jesus of the Gospels. 
So the the Gospels, if we look at how the Gospels were made, or at least the common theories of that, um, Mark is the primary Gospel, the the one that was written first, or that we have the earliest manuscripts of. Um, and it seems that Matthew and Luke were written as a response to Mark, and that Matthew and Luke may have shared what they call the, the theoretic or the Q text, um, or the Q gospel. The source they have source material that Mark didn't have. Um, so like first, and, and you've you probably already covered this on, on your channel. Uh, I didn't get a chance a chance to watch a lot of the videos in there. But when we're talking about the historical Jesus, um one, the the Gospels aren't historical documents. Uh, Pamela Eisenbaum and Alan Siegel, um, they believe the New Testament Gospels aren't reliable. And, and I believe a, a majority of the other scholars that I mentioned, Boyerin, Nanos, um, even Geza Vermesh would all agree that it's not a historically accurate book. They are theological works that were written decades after Jesus' death. Um, they were written by people that didn't know Jesus, um, and they were heavily influenced by theology. Um, Mark being the first gospel, but it's considered that the seven works of Paul that we think were most likely written by Paul were written before the gospels, and therefore the gospels are written out of that theological framework. Um now, that doesn't mean, and that's why the search for the historical Jesus becomes like figuring out what sayings are authentic to Jesus and what were theological things that the early church or the believers that started to believe a new theory of Jesus uh, were trying to put into the text. Um, and so that's what the search, you know, the Jesus seminar and the search for the historical Jesus um, was really to figure out what because textual criticism that the purpose of textual criticism is to say you know what is the authentic text what are the errors what was the author originally trying to convey right um you know when we look at new testament scholarship at least when it comes to like the historical jesus there's only two things that scholars agree on one that jesus was baptized and two that he was crucified um, when you look at the mark, in, the the primacy of Mark, well, the last portion of the Mark, all the accounts after resurrection was added onto the book. So you asked about the scholarship within the Jewish community when it comes to Jesus and the consensus within the Jewish community that with the, those who tackle the text, if you want to talk about a, a Jewish reclamation of Jesus is that he was a Jew, he lived as a Jew, he went to synagogue, um, you know. I, I'm trying to think, I don't know if I've seen scholarship that said he kept kosher, but I'm pretty sure he did. Um, he observed the festivals and everything. I mean, they were, you know, he talked about various festivals within the gospel, so that was within there. Um, he taught his message, and then he was crucified. Outside of that, then you're moving into the theological Jesus. So if you're talking about the post-resurrection accounts, the theology of Paul, that is all separate from the historical Jesus and where I would place um, Jewish scholarship scholarship on, on the historical Jesus. So uh, I wanted to discuss the controversial accusations made by certain individuals. And in our show, we have kind of tried to dismiss some of them as as almost like um, superstitions or just uh, ridiculous attacks that um, sometimes don't even make any sense. Um, so so just like uh, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach, I believe that the passages in the Talmud that that mention some type of Yeshu character are either uh, polemics that are based on on hearsay and limited information that they had at that time, or they're uh, historical, like almost like gaffes where they they just mixed a bunch of stuff together and they made they created an enemy that is from like different time periods 
or an issue they had and they put it on this Jeshu character. Um, so I, I asked you before the show on this idea of Jeshu Ben Pandera or Ben Stada. And, um, and so this guy on, on Facebook was saying uh, that it was actually a, a separate individual, but it was kind of like the individual that either became the Christian Jesus or like some other version or something. And that it, he was the son of a of a Roman soldier, and that his mom was a harlot, and that um, he practiced magic and all this stuff. Uh, do you think that bringing up stuff like that is even helpful? And is there any um, historical relevance to uh, bring up all these different Jesuses that are in opposition to the one that uh, even the one that historians can even discuss? Um. I would say it's informative to the, so the, the consensus would be that the theological Jesus was a myth that was an amalgamation of various messianic stories of, you know, uh, Jewish adherents in the first century who wanted to become king of the Jews and dispose the Greeks. Um, Jesus wasn't the only one. Um, so part of the theory is that the stories of Jesus are an amalgamation of those various texts. So now if we're talking about the polemics within the Talmud, um, they seem to be polemics and they're used as polemics against the Jesus of the New Testament. Um, and they may, they may as well be speaking to various stories that were pulled from various messianic adherents to the in the first century um but there is not strong evidence for it it's very weak um james tabor's book on on the topic though he does a really good job of making the case that there was a roman soldier pantera that lived in tiberius and was in that vicinity near that time um he makes a good case that such a person probably existed therefore the story in the talmud about jesus pantera and mary may have existed um i mean even the the jesus ossuary book that talks about um the potential find of a jesus ossuary that includes uh mary and joseph and it seems like all the names line up it's interesting i would say that any of that stuff is not definitive um does it matter in the end it's a polemic argument it does speak to the various messianic stories that may have made up what came to be known as the jesus of the theological um of what became the focus of the christian message um but again, that goes back to, one, I feel like establishing the historical Jesus, who he is, and then who he is within Judaism. Um, once you establish the historical Jesus, what that is within Judaism, then all of those other conversations, you know, can start to make sense a little bit more. But a lot of times, sometimes they get off in the minutia of things. You know, there, there's no way to prove that, you know, Pantera was Jesus' father or not. It's an interesting conversation to be had. Why is it there? And I think it's really interesting that James Tabor at least found evidence that um a person by that name was a centurion in the first century. So outside of that, I can't say much about it. We're going to run into the break in five minutes, but um, All right. can you, as, as a Jew, um, or would you ever be... Uh, open to the idea of Jesus being um, a holy man that not only was misunderstood. Well, to say that he was misunderstood is 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 to put a lot on the on the situation. So he's saying all this stuff about God. He's saying all this stuff about Torah, and then some crazy followers made him into a Messiah. But what if like uh, Hugh Schoenfeld um, said that like he actually believed that he was a Messiah or he had a messianic um, dream or, uh, or expectation. And then just like every prophet and 
every possible uh, leader who has uh, something to say in the Jewish world, he died with his beliefs. He died with his, um, you know, claiming something or asking people to to do teshuva, repentance, or to get closer to God. And so his aspirations to the messiahship were unfulfilled. Is that the same as someone being a fake messiah, where someone who, like Sabbatai's V or some other character who has this very high view himself and is willing to to destroy everything to to prove who they are. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that he could be a, a failed messiah, someone that it, if it would have worked out, he, he could have reached that goal? Or is or is that too much to put? It's, it's almost like another form of theological speculation, kind of like what Paul did. It's theological speculation for sure. Um, well, Oh, Svi, he converted to Islam at the end there. He was he was all over the place. Um, so I have questions, number one, about the apocalyptic and messianic as expert, uh, well, aspirations of Jesus. Um, how much of that was something he believed or was added later? It is possible... I don't see him as a false messiah, but definitely failed. Um, within the context of Judaism, he he failed to fulfill the most basic messiah, king, mashiach. I mean, messiah was never meant to be a savior in a spiritual sense, um, because the idea comes from Moshe, um, who delivered the Jewish people from Egypt, and eventually, through the 40 years in the wilderness, they got their own land. Mashiach, in the vein of Messiah, or, you know, Mashiach, I just said it twice, but anyways, you know, in the vein of Moshe, Mashiach was to deliver the, the people of Israel from captivity. Um, you know, the, the Romans were in charge there, and the ideas in the first century is they wanted a Messiah, a king, who would come in and you know, establish the kingdom of David. Um, at the time of Jesus, the temple was standing, so you can't rebuild it when it's standing. Um, but you would then gather the Jews and you establish world peace and Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel and Romans wouldn't be ruling, was the aspiration at the time. So as far as that, Jesus failed. Um, and the idea of a soul savior and like these other ideas that were added later burning fiery hell for eternity that you must be saved from um resembles more hades than uh like the 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 torture that they have in the greek greek pantheon and the, the random stuff that happens for eternity to people there and doesn't follow the jewish view of what gehenna is where it's a purification and then the soul goes to God after purification. Um, there's this fear that was created through hell and you need savior. And then the doctrine of original sin, you take good people, you tell them they're bad. You tell them they're going to go to hell. You need Jesus. All of a sudden people are ready to sign up. So that's going to sell pretty quickly. And then you take away the Jewish trappings and you tell people, Hey, you can stay as you are. You just need Jesus. Then all of a sudden, it's a very palatable religion. I wouldn't say that that's the religion that Jesus was advocating. And if we're moving back to like, I want to kind of lay the groundwork with the historical Jesus uh, within Judaism. The only things we know is he lived Jewishly, was baptized and he died. Um, there was no virgin birth. He wasn't resurrected. I, I know you were going into the theological claims of the gospels, but um, yeah. I have to push back on a couple of things. So uh, okay. I believe the idea of of uh, Gehinom becoming a, a purgatory style uh, purification thing is a later concept. And then the issue of uh, the Messiah being only a king uh, can be disputed because, you know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about two Mashiachs and one is uh, a priestly one. And the other one is, uh, you know, one is from... Aaron and the other ones from David. And uh, that's where the idea later on comes that there's two Mashiachs. 
Um, the the reason I bring up the concept of the fatal messiah is that one of my professors um, said that not only was the idea of Messiah ben Joseph developed in the Talmud to kind of like try to bring Jewish Christians back back into the fold, <coughs> sorry, to try to bring Jewish Christians back into the fold, but there was also the the concept of um, of being failed in the sense of any like he was a Kabbalist, so he said that anybody has the potential to be the Messiah. So that Jesus was one of the many contenders, and it was because he couldn't find anything in in the teachings of Jesus that it, that it was foreign to Judaism. Uh, now, if we talk about the virgin birth, if we talk about the passages that have been interpreted as him claiming to be divine, stuff like that, of course, all of these things come into into issue. But um, from you know, you mentioned the he lived a Jewish life. He was uh, anointed by uh, John the Immerser, and he was killed. Are those things impossible for a Messiah to experience? Because when people come up with this like very narrow view that the only Messiah is the Messiah that Maimonides um, described, they're not taking into consideration that in every generation before Jesus and after Maimonides and in between, everybody was claiming to be the Messiah in one way or another. Not everybody, but there was quite a few guys. And they were all claiming to be the Messiah based on the circumstances. So there was times where they thought the Messiah was going to come and 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 destroy the Muslims. And there was times they thought that he was going to destroy the Christians. And there was times that different contenders and different people would take people into the desert and then they would all die or something. So um, so it's almost like it's uh it's you were talking about the apocalyptic, so there comes to a point where that's what creates a problem. If you think that God is not doing what he's supposed to, then there's people who want to bring it about. So the way they bring it about yeah. is by getting into this very com conflictive and almost confrontational battle. And that's what the Essenes were doing in their own way. Uh, so do you think that he was, uh, like some people have described him as a revolutionary or someone who, was pushing the envelope and trying to like create conflict either with the other Jews or with the Romans. Uh, do you think that that's possible or is that uh, wishful thinking and some people trying to make him into like a uh, Bar Kokhba type of figure? Um, well, a, there's a lot in there. Okay, so the two Mashiachs, um, the claim in the New Testament is that he would be of the line of David, not of Aaron. So that would uh, preclude him from priestly service. Um, for the Messiah to come uh, after, he'd have to be a, a, of the lineage of Aaron. So I think that the history would go against that. Now, if you want to talk about what happened after Jesus died and how the myth making began and how the early followers of Jesus, the Hellenized Jews who began to kind of go their own way, um, and a growing number of Gentiles who adhered to, to that. Um, how do you come to terms with the fact that your leader is dead? And it, you know, if the gospel accounts are true, that he said, some of you living will, you know, see me coming on the clouds kind of thing. Uh, that didn't happen. So how do you come to terms with that? Um, so a lot of the apocalypticism seems to be revisionism to make sense of that and then make the message continue to be relevant. I would argue that's not necessary to make the words of Jesus relevant. You you know you there's a lot there's a lot to unpack here. You've mentioned the sayings of Jesus reflecting the things that other rabbis have said or Jewish teachers have said. If we're getting back to the historical Jesus and the best attested sayings of Jesus, I would agree that the sayings that we can most likely attest as historical, and they are not necessarily, you can find them in the New Testament, but if you read the entire Matthew through John, you're going to have stuff that's not. So if we're going back to the attested sayings of Jesus, I would say Jesus was not revolutionary in any sort, you know, any way. He actually seems to be, you know, 
pretty middle of the road. Um, I don't see him being too controversial. Now, you know, like the debates between Hillel and Shammai and some of the things, like a lot of the stuff kind of pans out within Jewish tradition, the same kind of conversations have been had. So I don't necessarily see him as a revolutionary in that sense. I see him as falling within sayings that you would hear other, you know, Jewish teachers or rabbis of that time say. So I don't see Jesus as a revolutionary in as much of the message that we can attest to him. Now, did he claim to be Mashiach? Uh, that's what he was crucified for. He was crucified as the king of the Jews. Um, so whether he said it or his followers believed it, um, there was that belief that he was going to Jerusalem to establish himself as king. Um, and that is what he was crucified for. So I would say that there was that belief, whether it was by Jesus himself or his followers, that he was going to Jerusalem to establish his rulership. Uh, that didn't pan out for him. So, um, but I don't really think Jesus was a revolutionary. I think he was kind of average when you look at his sayings. Like, I mean, honestly, what can you point out that he said that's, greatly contradicted or in opposition to things you can find in the Talmud. Well, people who claim that he was a, a physical revolutionary, like someone who wanted to battle and, and war, and we're going to do a review of of, guess, of um, Reza uh, Aslan's book, which has okay. more, more holes than uh, Rabbi Botea's book. But um, I want to talk about Paul because... It's been a while since I read that book. Uh, yeah, that's... Um... Paul well, I mean, he did. Jesus did have zealots and Zakari within his movement. Now, I mean, because Simon was called the zealot and Judas the Zakaria is that's uh, Greek, it, you know, the Hebrew. He was a Zakari, so Judas was a Zakari. Um, but there were Essenes in his community, in his group of followers. There's Pharisees. Um, I don't see evidence that Jesus was a zealot, but. He did make statements um, like he, you know, came to bring a, a sword and divide a mother from a father or I'd have to go. I don't know the language of that text right now. I have to look at it. But he you know, basically said he would divide a family. Um, and um, sorry, my phone's going off. Was, anyways, um, I don't necessarily see him as a, a zealot, but he had people that were amongst his movement movement that were. So, have you ever tried to compare uh, Paul to Philo or to other Hellenist Jews who, you know, even Maimonides has been accused of being a sellout because he was using Greek uh, ideas to describe Judaism. Uh, do you think that it's a possibility, if, if we put aside all the the hatred towards Paul for whatever people think he did, that he was uh, a mystically minded Jew? who incorporated Greek uh, ideas to get his message across and that somehow it had the unforeseen consequences of being completely uh, distorted to make him a, an antinomian enemy of the Torah and uh, an obsessive person about Jesus, where like you were saying that without Jesus, everybody's out and that Jesus becomes uh, allegiance to Jesus becomes the only ticket to to parties or, or heaven and and that you know he could have been a fanatical jew or he could have been a a, a very uh staunch you know adherent to to the message of jesus but why make him into this paganized um heretic or apostate that becomes like the enemy of the jewish people when he has both positive things to say about uh, jews and torah and then his criticism and then that could also be interpreted in so many different ways, and it's only been interpreted as anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic throughout history. Well, I'm not sure all those statements made by Paul can be attributed to Paul. Um, we don't have any original authorship from Paul. We have writings about Paul or writings that are uh, said to be from Paul. Um, if we had a first century manuscript that was authored by Paul, then we would know for sure what Paul said. 
Um, just like if we had writings from, you know, Peter, or James, or any of those that survived from the first century, we could say what they actually said. Um, we have copies of copies of copies that are hundreds of years later. Um, so to definitively say that these things came out of Paul's mouth, I mean, we have to prove that. Um, so it's not necessarily true that You know, whether or not it was things Paul said or was things that was put in his mouth centuries later when the Catholic Church um, took these stories and made it into what it was. I mean, it was a process. I mean, over time, the story started to divulge and change. But as orthodoxy grew, uh, what became orthodoxy, what became Catholicism, what became Christianity, um, they started focusing more and more on certain texts. But within those texts, they added things, they changed things. Um, you know, for example, when we're talking about textual criticism, um, there's the passage in John 1.18 that um, the older manuscripts say unique son, the later manuscripts say unique God. In Corinthians, um, there's additions about women being silent in church that's at different places in the text. Um, it's not, you know, there's manuscripts that have it at, at an early place and that's 40 verses later in another text. Um, you know, th there's things that not sure if, if we had the original manuscripts, we could say for sure. So I don't know if everything that is within the Pauline epistles came from Paul. If you want me to make a summary based on what's in them, that's a different question. Um based on what's in the Pauline epistles. Um, I don't see G, uh, his view of Jesus. And I don't see his view of Jew. Okay, so the claim is made that he's a student of Gamaliel. But I don't see his teachings aligning with that. Um, I see more of a Hellenistic Jewish influence. Um and I would put, you know, Paul's writings more in a Gnostic framework where it's based in knowledge. And that was the difference between James and Paul. Uh, James said salvation is essentially by works. And Paul says it's by believing in Jesus. It's having this knowledge that's going to save you. Um, that's more of a Gnostic idea. I don't see, if we look within the Jewish mystic tradition, I don't see Paul as a... Uh, Honestly, it, it feels very much different than uh, like if you're studying Tanya or Musar tradition or various mystical traditions within, I mean, even the Kabbalah. I don't see Paul's work within the mystical tradition. He seems to have more Stoic, Hellenistic, uh, Gnostic ideas than uh, I just wouldn't put him within the mystic tradition. I don't see enough support for that idea. Uh, well, we want to thank you for your time, and we appreciate you um, educating people. Uh, it seems like you have uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of information to share with uh, the people in that Facebook group where I met you. And uh, it it's important that uh, the people have like the whole picture. Uh, we see people that they find some information and they cling to it, and that's the only thing that that they incorporate into their their knowledge. So. Seems like you have uh, researched everything thoroughly and, you know, try to navigate all these concepts. So if in the future we would like to to have you back and um, I don't know if you want to um, refresh your memory on, on Reza Aslan's book, because I have my own theories. I actually was in contact with him about his mm -hmm. uh, his dissertation about uh, the book of Mark. And then he had another uh, thesis uh, paper that he did about um terrorist groups in the middle east and i think he he like fused them together to make that book uh because that it, there's something about that book that he's trying to convey and, and it takes some mm -hmm. some sophistication to to find but um here at the at the jesus wars we want to give everybody um as much information as possible so they can make their own decisions and we appreciate your your contribution to to our show uh yeah i appreciate that um 
you know, I did want to respond to one thing, if you have a moment that, you know, talking about apocalypticism and, and zealots and stuff like that, uh, you mentioned it earlier, and, and there's this danger that happens anytime somebody becomes very apocalyptic. And, and I think that Reza Aslan kind of deals with it in his book, and you kind of mentioned it, is that Anytime people have moved into that apocalyptic, like we are seeing Messiah now, we're going to make this happen. People tend to move into violent extremism. So, I mean, that's that's an issue that's kind of played itself out through history. And, yeah, uh, and, and I would like to discuss with you further about hyperbolic language where people assume that he was talking about the end and he was talking about apocalyptic stuff. And I think he was mm -hmm. eschatological, not apocalyptic. And there's mm -hmm. been uh, different books have been written about that, but uh, that's uh, for another show. But again, yeah, thank you. Anyways, I thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we can do this again. Definitely. Take care. Right, yeah, we're going to.